uh, when I uh, start my lecture, shall I uh, uh, stop my video? Yeah, please, please. I, I will start right now. Sure. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Podcast. Today is Tuesday, May 30th, 2023. I am Rifat Manan in California, and I am remotely joined by my good friend Emilio Madrigal in Boston. Today, we are very delighted to welcome Dr. Anwar Raja, who is Professor of Pathology at Loma Linda University in California. And today, she is going to deliver a cytology talk, which we believe would be very useful for uh, trainees who are preparing for boards. And otherwise, also, it should be very useful for trainees overall. And thank you, Dr. Raja, for joining us today. Uh, as always, uh, please, you can uh, post your questions and comments on YouTube and Facebook chat windows, and we will pass on to Dr. Raja at the end of the session. Thank you again, Dr. Raja. Over to you now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Manan, for inviting me uh, to give uh, this re uh, review. Um, cytology is very vast. We have all the body systems. So what I'm going to do is present um, selected uh, case images. So let me stop my video and uh, continue. So in cytology, we're looking at cells from aspirates or brushings or exfoliative um, cytology. And uh, the thing to remember is common things occur commonly. Um, you need to know what they are and what they look like. And um, you can really diagnose most of the cases. Uh, and once you come to um, an assessment and a diagnosis, the common problem is, particularly in lung and liver and lymph nodes, well, where's the primary form? So you need to know special stains, which ancillary studies uh, may be utilized. And always in pathology, not just in cytology, the triple test correlate with the clinical findings, uh, you know, what does radiology think? And then again, what are you seeing uh, under the microscope? So uh, what I did was selected um, um, certain um, classic cytology images from various body sites and um, I hope this will be helpful for everybody. So uh, on GYN cytology, you can get lots of infections and this I'm going to be showing you trich trichomonas infection. Notice in the background, you have superficial and intermediate squamous cells. And these almost look like parabasal cells, but these are the organisms, the trichomonas organisms. You recognize the trichomonas organisms by the uh, eccentric elliptic nucleus here, you may see some granularity in the cytoplasm. Uh, they are fl flagellated organisms. And then some of the liquid-based uh, preparations, you may be able to see the flagella, but uh, usually not. A clue that there's trichomonas would be, uh, notice this perinuclear halo here uh, around uh, these squamous cells. If you see a lot of these perinuclear halos, then look for some cause for infection. It could be candida, but with trichomonas especially, you can see a lot of this. Also in trichomonas, the background can be rather filmy or sort of mucoid appearing. So uh, some clues for trichomonas uh, infection, um, they may uh, let you know that the patient has a frothy malodorous discharge having um, itchy, uh, itching and then, uh, you know, pelvic perineal pain. Uh, another clue is um, that the cervix resembles um, a strawberry because of those punctate hemorrhages because of the congestion. Uh, the squamous superficial and intermediate squamous epithelial cells will show these perinuclear vacuoles. The background is dirty, or almost um, filmy, almost as if there's a haze there, and lots of neutrophils. Uh, however, sometimes
sometimes you may not see that many neutrophils and the neutrophils may form these aggregates. Uh, and because of the inflammation, there may be pseudo maturation with more um, superficial cells, maybe even parakeratosis. Um, there's, uh, the organism can be um, tricky and sort of uh, be in the background and look uh, sort of resemble parabasal cells. And uh, the size of the organism is quite variable. There is an inverse relationship between the size of the trichomonas organism and the severity of infection. The smaller the size, the more severe the infection. Sometimes uh, you may ha have a patient with trichomonas infection without many neutrophils in the background. So really um, go at high power and look at for that. And to uh, recognize the organisms, you do need to see the eccentric elliptical nucleus. You may um, also sometimes see red uh, cytoplasmic granules. Sometimes with a trichomonas um, infections, there may be ad uh, additional um, organisms, particularly these long filamentous bacteria that used to be called leptotrix. Uh, and uh, so you see trichomonas, and then if you see these long filamentous uh, bacteria um, uh, that used to be called leptotrix in the background. This is a classic um, cytology image of um, low-grade squamous intraepithelial neoplasia. The, this is the uh, coilocyte. Uh, notice that the nuclei are dark. The chromatin is um, coarse uh, irregularly clumped. There's nuclear membrane irregularity. And this is very characteristic. You have a cavity. It's not a perinuclear halo. That looks like a perinuclear halo, right? Right? This is a cavity. So this is very classic uh, for a uh, low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. Uh, these, uh, those are the coilocytes. It's a viral cytopathic effect, and this affects the uh, intermediate or superficial cells. And these the coilocytes have this distinct, sharp, dense periphery for this cavity. And the nuclei also have to be dysplastic. They're large, irregular membranes. Binucleation is a core common. But just because you see binucleation without the cavity doesn't automatically make it a um, low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. Your differential would be a glycogenated cell. So if you um, sort of go up and down, you may see a little bit yellowish pigment. That's the glycogenated cells. And the inflammatory halos uh, that, that I just showed you in trichomonas. So that's just very nonspecific. A cavity has to have this very well-defined large area with a uh, condensation around. So this is a viral cytopathic uh, effect. And another thing that they can ask about this uh, is, well, this is a productive uh, infection with HPV for, uh, for these um, L-cell lesions, and there's non-integration of um, HPV uh, DNA in these. Okay. All right. Now, uh, um, High-grade squamous intraepithelial le lesions. Uh, in low-grade lesions, the cell size uh, are um, superficial and intermediate cells, but uh, for these uh, H-cell lesions, the size resembles parabasal cells. The nucleus to cytoplasmic uh, ratio is much greater. And also notice how the chromatin is irregularly clumped. There may be nuclear membrane irregularities as well. So this would be um, H-cell. Another very classic uh, image um, that you should recognize in GYN um, cytology is endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ. And uh, how do you recognize that? These are glandular cells. They have a columnar shape. Notice the elongated nuclei, this irregular clumping, this hyperchromasia. And they are trying to form these uh, sort of rosettes, almost like glandular spaces here. And at the periphery, you may see a nuclei uh, sort of budding off. This is called feathering, right? These 
glandular sort of rosetting, they sort of coming around the so-called gland space and notice how the hyperchromatic crowded groups that you see here. So how do you recognize endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ? Uh, the first thing is you'll start seeing a lot of glandular cells. Perhaps it's just the way that it was um, sampled, but uh, notice uh, you'll start seeing lots of um, endocervical like columnar cells and then crowded groups. And you'll notice there's nuclear hyperchromasia. There'll be rosetting where they, um, uh, architecturally, they're around this uh, central space, the feathering where the nuclei appear to be coming off. The nuclei are uh, elongated, cigar shaped, hyperchromatic with high NC ratios. Also, you'll start seeing mitotic figures. And uh, these mitosis are so called jumping mitosis. It's something that's more appreciated in histology where the mito my mitotic figures are. A, a supranuclear, also apoptotic bodies. Now, the difference between endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ and invasive adenocarcinoma is um, in invasion, um, you'll see all the same features. However, there'll also be a tumor diathesis in the background and there will be prominent nucleoli. In uh, endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ, the nucleoli are inconspicuous. A classic uh, image of squamous cell carcinoma. This is a pap stain. Notice the orange of filia of the cytoplasm, dense cytoplasm, well-defined cytoplasmic borders. Look at the nuclei, high nucleus to cytoplasmic ratio. Uh, the, uh, they are hyperchromatic, very dark, irregular. And this is invasive uh, carcinoma. Notice the clinging, dirty, tumor diathesis uh, in the background here. So for squamous cell carcinoma, dark chromatin, dense cytoplasm with very distinct cell borders, a clinging dirty tumor, tumor diathesis. And then you can start seeing abnormal shapes, sort of tadpole shapes or pencil shaped cells. Um, and the other thing for squamous cell carcinoma, uh, is on a pap stain, uh, there's differential staining. You can see the orange of filia of the cytoplasm. However, um, um, you don't always have to see or orange of filia in the cytoplasm for this to be squamous cell, right? Now, the thing to remember about squamous cell carcinoma is uh, with metastases to lymph nodes, uh, you may... Uh, have cystic metastases. And if there's keratin being produced, there's a response to the keratin. So you may have foreign body giant cell, it almost appears to be granulomatous. Uh, and so um, unless you notice that there's a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma, you might think it's granulomatous lymphadenitis. So that can be a pitfall. So um, even uh, in the cervix, you may have a primary small cell and neuroendocrine uh, carcinoma. And if the small cell carcinoma, high nucleus to cytoplasmic ratios, um, very, very scant cytoplasm, so much so that the uh, nuclei uh, sort of uh, push against each other and there's molding. The chromatin is a coarsely clump, so-called salt and pepper chromatin pattern. A lot of um, tumor diathesis, lots of mitosis, apoptosis in the background. So small cell carcinoma of the uh, cervix, it's uh, strongly associated with HPV infection, particularly um, type uh, HPV 18. And HPV 18 also causes squamous and adeno and adenosquamous uh, carcinoma of the cervix. Of, and is usually primary small cell uh, carcinoma of the cervix is associated with um, squamous cell or adeno or adenosquamous uh, carcinomas. 
So uh, for small cell, uh, we talked about the high NC ratio, very scant, delicate cytoplasm. Because the NC ratio is so high, the nuclei mold against each other, salt and pepper chromatin. The nucleoli are inconspicuous. Uh, lots of mitosis, apoptosis, and necrotic background with the tumor diathesis. And the cells are so fragile, it's very easy to have the crush artifact. Okay, this is a classic image for follicular cervicitis. So it's when you have uh, uh, lymphoid aggregates with germinal centers in the cervix. And how do you recognize that? You see lymphocytes, like a mixture of lymph lymphoid cells, small and large. And here in the center is a macrophage with debris inside. This is the tangible body macrophage that you can see right here. So uh, follicular uh, cervicitis, there is an association with chlamydia infection, and uh, it's not lymphoma, which is so rare in the cervix, so primary uh, lymphoma of the cervix, usually there's an abnormal cervix, it may be enlarged or ulcerated, uh, as opposed to in follicular cervicitis. Follicular cervicitis uh, tends to occur in older patients with thinner atrophic um, epithelium, and um, you see um, a range of maturation of the lymphoid cells, the characteristic blocky chromatin pattern of the lymphocyte nuclei, and then the tangible body, uh, body macrophages. Even reactive lymph nodes, when you do the aspirate, you'll see a range of maturation you know, and tangible body macrophages uh, in these cases. And sometimes in high-grade lymphomas, you can see lots of tangible body macrophages. Right, some uh, pertinent um, um, thyroid uh, lesions. Okay, now uh, this is an aspirate uh, from a patient with Hashimoto thyroiditis. This is very classic. These are the thyroid follicular cells with uh, sort of abundant cytoplasm that's very granular. This is uh, the metaplastic cells, oncocytic metaplasia, so-called Hertel cells. And notice in the background, you do see lots of lymphocytes, maybe plasma cells. And you can even see some of the lymphocytes in the cytoplasm of these uh, thyroid follicular cells. So with the right mm -hmm. clinical history, cytology, this fits with Hashimoto thyroiditis. Um, the diagnosis is usually clinical. It's only when there's a dominant nodule or they're worried about um, uh, there being a possible neoplasia, would they do a um, fine needle aspiration in a patient with known Hashimoto thyroiditis. So lots of lymphocytes, uh, and uh, you can get these lymphoid tangles with streaks of those lymphoid cells, oncocytic cell change of the thyroid follicular cells, a pleomorphic population of these um, follicular and lymphoid cells, a very scant um, colloid. And um, sometimes you see lots and lots of lymphoid cells. The main thing is there is an increased risk for development of lymphoma. So if you uh, see a, an abundance of lymphoid cells or maybe pure lymphoid cells, it could be a perithyroidal lymph node that was aspirated. However, uh, you know, a low grade lymphoma, mucosa associated lymphoma uh, may occur. So it's a good idea to ascend it for ancillary studies such as flow cytometry or do stain so that you don't miss a lymphoma. Classic um, PAP image for papillary thyroid carcinoma. Um, notice the intranuclear pseudo inclusions, and the inclusions have the same tinctorial um, uh, sort of change as the cytoplasm because this is a cytoplasm that's herniating and comes to lie between the um, nuclear membrane and the nucleus, right? So you can see these intranuclear pseudo inclusions and where the invagination is occurring, you may see grooves, uh, nuclear grooves, uh, pseudo inclusions, and also sometimes septated um, change in the cytoplasm. And the other thing about th papillary thyroid carcinoma, Unlike, you know, when you just think, uh, you know, dysplasia, carcinoma, I think hyperchromasia, this is one of the tumors that's very 
very hypochromatic, so pale powdery chromatin. Also, uh, when you see nucleoli, uh, they oftentimes tend to be eccentric. Uh, sometimes you can even see them next to the uh, nuclear membrane. Okay, so eccentric uh, nuclei, nuclear grooves, uh, pseudo inclusions, um, and pale powdery chromatin. Um, and here, notice another pseudo inclusion uh, here. And um, hypochromasia, here's a nucleolus adjacent to a nuclear membrane. And here is this lamellated concretion. This is a somoma body. So for papri thyroid carcinoma to diagnose that, you want to see somoma bodies of a good, uh, a true papillary structure with a blood vessel running through this. If you don't see that, and if you just see some of the nuclear features, the grooves, etc., it could be a follicular variant of papillary thyroid carcinoma. It could be a, um, a NIFT piece. So in those, you would say suspicious for malignancy in the um, TBS uh, category. So papillothyroid carcinoma, uh, pale powdery uh, chromatin, micronucleus that may be adjacent to the nuclear membrane, nuclear grooves, pseudo inclusions, and then other things, you know, you may see some more bodies. And when you do see the colloid, it's dark, it's thick, um, you know, ropey, it resembles chewing gum, it's just very thick. And then you see multinucleated giant cells as well. And you can do um, stains and uh, various um, studies um, to uh, confirm, particularly if you just see a, a few cells in a lymph node. And the question is, is this metastatic papillary or not, you may utilize stains. This is um, a pap stain for medullary thyroid carcinoma. Notice uh, the salt and pepper chromatin pattern. Uh, you may see um, it can have variable morphology, a little spindling of the nuclear. Sometimes you can have triangular cells, plasmacytoid cells. Now, what you see in the background here is not colloid. This is amyloid. It can resemble colloid somewhat, but you know, if there's any doubt, always do the stains uh, for medullary thyroid carcinoma and um, for amyloid. So medullary thyroid carcinoma can have these plasma cytoid nuclei, eccentric nuclei. Uh, oftentimes you may see binucleation, maybe red granules in the cytoplasm and salt and pepper chromatin pattern uh, as seen here. So it's a great mimic. Always think about it, in the, particularly in the head and neck and thyroid area. So you can have a tri, you know, fusiform, spindle-shaped plasma cytide um, cells uh, binucleation as well as multinucleation is common, salt and pepper chromatin pattern, and granularity in the cytoplasm. And you can do um, stains for neuroendocrine markers, TTF1 is positive, CEA, as well as uh, calcitonin. Now, follicular lesions. Uh, for these, you do need to have histology. So um, when would you call it suspicious for follicular neoplasm or follicular neoplasm? It's when you start seeing a cellular aspirate and you see lots of thyroid follicular cells. However, there is um, hardly any uh, colloid in the background. And also the cell groups are numerous, three-dimensional with overlapping nuclei. Sometimes you will see repetitive micro follicles, so that's very helpful as well. So this one, uh, you cannot uh, go any higher than that it's um, suspicious for follicular neoplasm or follicular neoplasm. You look to see, do you see features of papillary thyroid carcinoma, such as nuclear grooves or uh, pseudo-inclusions? Herthal cell lesions, uh, the oncocytic cells would have a red granular cytoplasm and the nuclei can be very, very uh, bizarre appearing and you may have prominent nucleoli, but it's the cytoplasmic granularity that's a good clue. 
Um, we have reporting ca categories, you know, for GYN cytology, we have the Bethesda system. We also have the Bethesda system for reporting um, thyroid uh, fine needle aspirates. So uh, we should be familiar with these, uh, you know, when do you call it, you know, non-diagnostic. If you basically don't see enough cells. You want to see about six, uh, six or more groups of cells, you know, six to 10 in each group. Uh, however, if you just see macrophages, you know it's cystic, but it could be a cystic tumor or it could be just a degenerating colloid nodule. So that's, uh, uh, you know, that would uh, go, possibly go in that category. Uh, then Hashimoto's, Dequervin's, thyroiditis, you can just definitely call it benign. Um, and then these are the ones where they would need to do ancillary testing. If, you know, it's there's some atypia of follicular lesion of undetermined uh, significance. So they call the patient back depending on the clinical and imaging findings, and then do a repeat aspirate and also send the specimen for molecular testing. Same for follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm. However, if you're suspicious for malignancy or call it malignant, then the patient can go for definitive uh, treatment. So some salivary gland uh, lesions that you should be familiar with. Um, more than tumor this, uh, again, uh, would be something with oncocytic cells and lots of lymphocytes as well. And uh, they may give you a history that the patient's a smoker, is cystic, and dark fluid was aspirated. So more than uh, tumors, um, uh, when you aspirate uh, these, they're often cystic, more common in males because males uh, tend to smoke more. And... Um, I showed you the cytology and it's very helpful in the cell block when you see this uh, double layer of oncocytic cells and here are the lymphocytes associated with that. And this is the histology of a Warden um, tumor. So see lots and lots of oncocytes, lymphocytes, it's cystic, there's been macrophages, cholesterol crystals, it's been around for a while. Pleomorphic uh, adenoma. It's very easy on a difficult um, um, stain. However, on a pap stain, notice this background and you have a mixture of cell types, right? There will be the uh, sort of uh, epithelial cells as well as myepithelial cells. And the myepithelial cells are so-called these hyaline cells or plasma cytoid in appearance, as you can see here. Notice this magenta fibrillary background that you see here. That's been likened to a troll's hair, you know, this magenta fibrillary um, appearance. So you'll see uh, pleomorphic uh, adenoma, it can be rather cellular, hypocellular, depending, you know, uh, where the aspirate uh, came from, see this mixture of epithelial uh, and myepithelial cells, this mesenchymal um, cells and stroma. You may see these pink petal shaped uh, tyrosine crystalloids sometimes. And then you can um, also um, do some studies uh, just to confirm. Adenoid cystic uh, carcinoma. Notice you have this thick, globular uh, material here. This is a basement membrane material, but the cells are small and basaloid, very dark uh, sort of nuclei, small basaloid cells. There's both epithelial and myepithelial cells. And these on a pap stain, sometimes you can just see these empty spaces where the basement membrane material is. On a diff quake, it's much more prominent. You have these uh, sort of gumball or these globoid uh, sort of globules of the basement membrane material, it's not fibrillary, right? So it's not pleomorphic adenoma, very dark uh, nuclei and, and small basaloid nuclei. They resemble watermelon seeds. And anoisistic custom, sometimes it'll be a patient will have a painful lesion because it's uh, often there's perineural invasion or maybe facial paralysis. It's the most common malignant salivary gland, a tumor of the minor salivary glands. In the parotids, it's going to be mucor epidermoid uh, carcinoma. So small um, basaloid um, cells in tight clusters. 
Now, mucoepidermoid uh, carcinoma, you'll see a mixture of cell types, maybe some glandular cells, intermediate uh, type cells, and then some squamoid cells as well. So mucoepidermoid uh, carcinoma. So always think about the possibility of that. Acinic cell carcinoma, they resemble salary gland acini. So they have cymogen granules in the background. They have these traversing capillaries and granular cytoplasm uh, uh, with the zymogen uh, granules, and oftentimes they may be a dispersed bare nuclei. The same appearance would be seen in pancreatic um, acinic cell carcinoma as well. So uh, monotonous population, loosely cohesive cells, uh, and um, oftentimes bare nuclei. The NC ratio is not very high. A classic zymogen granules that are PS diastase uh, positive, and then uh, there are various stains that you could use for a cynic cell carcinoma. Now for cell regen cytology, you have a system that's known as the Milan uh, system. So uh, again, um, non-diagnostic or something that's um, benign, non-neoplastic, for example, granulomatous um, lesions, or maybe there's a reactive intra or periparotid lymph node. Or if you see some atypia, then you would put it in category three. And neoplastic uh, warden tumor would be uh, you know, category 4A benign. Uh, and then um, if you see small basaloid cells and you know it's neoplastic, you don't know if it's adenoid cystic, basal cell adenoma, et cetera, then you would call it a salivary gland neoplasm of uncertain malignant potential. Or suspicious for malignancy, or quite um, frankly, uh, if you know it's malignant, then uh, the, you're advised to give a grade. Now, breast um, cytopathology. Um, lactational changes, this can be a pitfall. It's very cellular. You see lots and lots of these bare nuclei with prominent nucleoli, but notice the frothy background. These are the milk globules. So this is young patient. This uh, think, well, why isn't this lactational change, right? So this is the appearance for um, an aspirate um, from a, a patient who may be nursing or uh, pregnant. Um, fibroadenoma can be another one with a pitfall, very uh, classic, very well-defined uh, breast uh, lesion with circumscribed border and an aspirate. They, can, uh, they may be very, very cellular and sometimes quite diseasive. So fibroadenoma, you have the glandular epithelial cells and the stromal component as well. And when you go up and down on these clusters, uh, we'll see both the epithelial and the myepithelial component, which is a half a focus above or below the epithelial component, right? And also notice there's a hint of this dichotomous branching here, so-called antler horn type, right? So dichotomous branching. So epithelial, myepithelial cells, and here's the stromal component in a fibroadenoma. Another uh, biphasic uh, lesion in the breast would be a phalloides tumor. Again, epithelial uh, as well as stromal component, but notice the stroma is very hypercellular and start seeing mitotic figures uh, here. You know, sometimes maybe an older patient could be, uh, you know, larger or a history of something recurring after, a, you know, a fibroadenoma was re removed from the breast and is around the same site. Then you think, well, hey, could this be a phalloides tumor? Learn to recognize, um, you know, a carcinoma NOS of the breast, a ductal carcinoma. Notice these epithelial cells, they can have a somewhat plasma cytoid appearance, high nucleus to cytoplasmic ratio, but you don't see the myopithelial component, right? So it's just these epithelial cells. So ductal carcinoma, here's another example of uh, ductal uh, carcinoma, you know, lots and lots of these um, cells with high NC ratios, and there is um, there's a lack of the myopithelial component. Lobular carcinoma of the breast. Uh, these uh, uh, the cell size is smaller. They resemble lymphocytes. 
both ductal and lobular crush on the breast can have these intracytoplasmic um, vacuoles, but they're much far more common in lobular carcinoma of the breast. And sometimes there may be mucin droplets inside as well. And sometimes they may line up in these linear arrays as they do in histology as well. So lobular carcinoma. Mucinous carcinoma, patient has a soft um, sort of uh, well-defined mass, but it's soft, it's not hard or gritty, but notice all the mucin in the background. And then these are the tumor cells floating in the um, mucin. Uh, Gradicell tumor. Uh, we've had cases uh, that where um, on BIRAD scoring, they're very convinced that this is going to be malignant, but um, this these uh, are cells with very granular cytoplasm. And also notice that the granules are also present in the background, not just with the cells. And the first time we saw a case like this, we thought, could this just be fibrocystic change, you know, with the oncocytic cells? So, but this can be a pitfall. So granular cell, uh, granular cell tumor of the breast and um, an body site would appear this uh, similar, uh, appears oncocytic because of the granularity of the cytoplasm and then you need to do the uh, S100 um, uh, stains for that. Um, some examples of respiratory cytology, uh, a creola body. Now creola body is when a part of the, uh, uh, airway is being coughed up. And these are the ciliated respiratory columnar cells over here. And, oh, let me go back. And then uh, when you look at the periphery, um, it's, uh, you can see the cilia, right? Otherwise, if you just look at these cell clusters, you would be concerned, could this be adenocarcinoma? But notice uh, there may be terminal bars and lots and lots of cilia. So this is a creola body. And uh, then uh, there may be a question, well, you know, when do you see this? It's a very common in patients who are asthmatic. And so these are sloughed, uh, ciliated columnar cells uh, due to some respiratory epithelial damage. Um, also in asthmatics, you'll see eosinophils with the charcoal laden crystals and then Kirschman spirals where you have this um, spiral sh shaped uh, mucus being um, sort of uh, coughed up, right? So here's uh, some Cushman spirals where you can see the spiral shaped uh, structures and it's darker in the center and uh, somewhat lighter at the periphery, right? So Cushman spirals, again, when do you see Cushman spirals? Where uh, you have excess mucus uh, production in patients with bronchial obstruction, common in asthmatics and uh, there'll be lots of use in the fills in patients with asthma. Uh, also seen in patients who, uh, with chronic bronchitis and cigarette um, smoking. And cushion spirals are seen in the respiratory tract, but they may be seen in other sites, such as cervical vaginal cytology and even um, um, gallbladder. Any time uh, uh, sort of with glandular cells with some mucus production. Pneumocystis um, infection, um, it appears on a BAL, it appears very frothy, and you can see some small dots here as well, right? Tiny, tiny dots, very frothy background. And do the silver stains to uh, highlight the cup-shaped um, organisms. Uh, and it's one of the uh, AIDS-defining criteria in HIV-positive uh, patients. Learn to recognize granulomatous inflammation in lymph nodes, lungs, and various body sites. So uh, what about granulomas? Notice um, these uh, epithelioid histiocytes uh, over here and uh, uh, carrot-shaped nuclei, mixed inflammatory cells. You may see multinucleated giant cells. They may or may not be necrosis, but notice these uh, sort of carrot-shaped uh, nuclei. These are very, very uh, helpful. So, uh, and once you see this uh, at the time of rose, uh, then, um, you know, you've suggested granulomatous inf inflammation. They may uh, 
ask for, you know, send it off for cultures and you can do special stains, etc. Adenocarcinoma anywhere in the body. Glandular adenocarcinoma, the nuclei are usually central and they have prominent nucleoli and the NC ratio would be increased. Sometimes you can see these sort of gland formation with the nuclei uh, somewhat um, at the periphery. And the cytoplasm is not as dense as in squamous cell carcinoma, there may be vacillation in the cytoplasm. There may be intracytoplasmic you know, vacuoles with maybe mucin production as well. And then just a dishesion uh, going on and maybe uh, a tumor diathesis as well. So uh, adenocarcinoma, three-dimensional groups of cells, maybe papillary formation or asana groups. And um, the rosettes and neuroendocrine tumors can uh, resemble the glandular SNI, uh, and I'll show you an example of that. And when you have metastatic adenocarcinoma in different sites, uh, you know, it could be from anywhere, but the uh, top things to consider to rule out would be breast, lung, kidney, um, thyroid lesions, and then, of course, the history and imaging findings are helpful. Newer endocrine tumors, notice. Uh, um, the main thing for your endocrine tumors look for the chromatin, coarse chromatin, salt and pepper chromatin, maybe eccentric nuclear plasma cytoid, and this rosetting kind of appearance may resemble sort of as uh, you know uh, these um, glandular uh, groups as well. Small cell uh, carcinoma, again, um, salt and pepper chromatin, very high NC ratio, um, scan cytoplasm, and that's why you have this characteristic nuclear molding where they brush up against and sort of push against each other's uh, nuclear background would be diathesis, lots of mitotic figures, and apoptosis. Small cell carcinoma and uh, invasive lobular carcinoma in tissue as well as in um, fluids. You'll see these linear caterpillar like array of cells. Notice the um, uh, for small cell carcinoma, like the salt and pepper chromatin, and how you have these linear groups, maybe a little bit of molding going uh, coming along here. And they're small, they somewhat resemble lymphocytes as well. For lymph, anytime you have lymphoid cells, uh, notice in the background you have these small little blue uh, dots. These are the um, sort of uh, you know, strips of um, the cytoplasm of lymphocytes, and they can be seen whenever there's um, uh, lymphoid cells, not just in lymphoma. It just means that you have lymphocytes. Uh, around. So if they ask you a question, what are these? They're just strips of the cytoplasm. For lymphoma, you want to see more like a monomorphic population, maybe lots of mitosis. And oftentimes the mitosis are flower shaped going all the way around. All right. So uh, lymphoma here. And then here's another example uh, of lymphoma. Blue uh, scan cytoplasm, but it's very blue in appearance. And then uh, notice those uh, little blue blobs in the background. Those are the um, uh, uh, small pieces of the cytoplasm of the lymphocytes. Mesothelial cells, uh, you know, on fluids, uh, on plural perineal fluids, or even transabdominal, transthoracic uh, needle aspirates, you may pick up these mesothelial cells. And uh, they're very two-dimensional, and uh, they have these... Um, spaces in between them. Uh, so uh, they sort of plate like two dimensional, the nuclear equidistance, they may be a little nuclear membrane irregularity. And then they have these windows in between the cells because uh, uh, mesothelial cells tend to have these long microvilli, so they can't really come very close together. So the microvilli keep them apart. And um, they have these peripheral sort of lacy skirt. Uh, there's, the cytoplasm is more dense uh, around the nucleus and a little sort of less dense uh, in the periphery because uh, of the organelles and the long microvilli. And then they can ball up, they can um, um, develop vacuoles and they can really resemble adenocarcinoma, even squamous cell carcinoma. So definitely need to do um, stains. Um, 
uh, if there's any doubt. So you have to know the stains for fluid cytology and don't just do one or two stains. Uh, you should do multiple uh, stains, at least two or three of, of each, uh, at least two of each, right? So uh, the adenocarcinoma stains are given here. And then, you know, uh, uh, and for mesothelial cells, calretinin, WT1, D240 uh, can be used. Now, mesothelioma, because you often see mesothelial cells, when should you suspect mesothelioma? You see lots more mesothelial cells. They're larger in size. They're large groups, larger in size as well. And um, as opposed to adenocarcinoma, mesothelia, uh, mesothelioma groups tend to have more of a knobbly outer border, but you know that's a very soft uh, criterion. Um, you may see the you know the lacy skirts, the windows uh, between the groups of cells, and then need to do um, the stains for mesothelial cells, uh, you know, some of the keratins, WT1, calretin, but then how do you know they're not just benign mesothelial cells? How do you know this is mesothelioma? So you can uh, do stains for BAP1 loss and, and TAP loss. Um, so that, that uh, would uh, confirm that this uh, these are malignant uh, mesothelial cells and not just reactive mesothelial cells. Some urine cytology, ileal uh, conduit um, urine. Uh, they may just say urine, NOS, right? But recognize this. You see all these, lots and lots of these uh, melamid uh, Walensky bodies here. These uh, are just lysosomes. These aren't red blood cells. And it just has this dirty background and very rounded cells. So uh, so when you have the ileal conduit, uh, these are the de degenerating intestinal lining cells that are rounding up. And you have those, cytoplasmic inclusions, and uh, those lysosomal inclusions are known as the melamid uh, Wolinska bodies. In urine cytology, the other thing you should know is um, the polyoma or BK virus infection. And the main differential is going to be, well, is this um, high-grade urethral carcinoma or carcinoma in situ? The clue is it's very glassy, smudgy, um, uh, uh, appearance to the nucleus. Uh, sometimes you have these little tails to them, but then urethelial cells can have that circular form appearance as well, right? And then you can do stains as well. So these, uh, this is a histology of the polyoma virus infection and large dark nuclei and, um, you know, smudgy inclusion, thick nuclear membrane. And sometimes you may have very reticulated chromatin or just empty uh, nuclei. And your differential would be, um, you know, high-grade urethral carcinoma, CIS, or other um, uh, viral inclusions such as CMV. Also in urine cytology, something uh, that uh, you're expected to know in older male patients, you may see these seminal vesicle cells and the best clue is the pigment in the cytoplasm. And they look bizarre. These are so-called monster cells. These are just seminal vesicle cells that are being um, shed off, right? So just the pigment from the seminal vesicle cells. Clear cell, renal cell carcinoma, anytime you have an adenocarcinoma with clearing of the cytoplasm, make sure you um, exclude uh, renal, clear cell, renal cell carcinoma. It can occur in metastatic sites all over the body. A clear cytoplasm, the NC ratio is not that high, so it can be rather deceptive, maybe prominent nucleoli. And this is another one of those tumors that's very vascular, so you'll see traversing capillaries in these as well. Right, liver lesions, hepatocell carcinoma, the hepatocytes resemble, uh, um, you know, the ACC resembles normal hepatocytes. However, notice that the plates are widened, right? Prominent nucleoli, the stop uh, sign-like nucleoli, high nucleus to cytoplasmic ratios here. And then you may see some rimming with um, endothelial cells, like as you can see over here. So hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, 
and a high NC ratio, prominent nucleoli. Some, they're very cellular, very dishesive. You may see lots and lots of these bare nuclei, as you can see in the background, right, over here. And then uh, you may see some hints of bile being produced. So here's bile plugs over here, so hepatocellular uh, carcinoma. So uh, very cellular aspirates, very dishesive, and they resemble hepatocytes, but they have thick uh, trabeculae. This is another one uh, of the tumors with those traversing um, capillaries between the cell groups. And then um, endothelial cells um, surround these, uh, you know, widened trabeculae and you can do stains uh, for that. So CD34 would stain for these endothelial cells. And, um, you know, here's another example of bile being produced, granular cytoplasm, widened uh, sort of uh, plates. And um, HCC can also have intranuclear clearing uh, in them. And, you know, I talked about the atypical strip uh, nuclei, and uh, you can have mallory bodies as, you know, and other types of cytoplasmic inclusions. Another type of liver, a primary liver tumor is fibrolamellar carcinoma. These, the NC ratio is low, uh, but uh, these uh, cells are polygonal and very eosinophilic, right? So notice the eosinophilia of these um, cells, and you may or may not see the um, sort of lamellar um, stromal component. So this is not associated with cirrhosis. You have a central scar with fibrous lamellae large polygonal um, tumor cells with eosinophilic granular cytoplasm uh, and uh, the lamellar fibrosis may not be quite uh, obvious on fine needle aspirations. And, um, uh, you know, CK7, 8, and 18 positive. It's also positive uh, for some of the neuroendocrine markers, but it's AFP negative fibrolamellar carcinoma. This is a BAL specimen. And notice these calcium oxalate crystals. When you see these, look in the background for aspergillus, right? So aspergillus niger, particularly, you'll see the calcium oxalate uh, uh, crystals. And that can be a test question. Um, a neck mass in a patient with end-stage renal disease was on dialysis, and notice this aspirate shows uh, these small round blue cells and a frothy background. They look like lymphocytes, right? Or could this be something from the thyroid? But a patient has end-stage renal disease. This is an example of, uh, from a patient with enlarged parathyroid gland. It could be adenoma, hyperplasia, or a carcinoma. So decisive population, small round blue cells, granular frothy background. And you know you can do stains for uh, parathyroids. Um, some uh, pertinent pancreatic lesions that you need to know. Pancreatic ductal carcinoma. Well, what are the clues? You have these aspirates, the cell sizes increase. If you can compare with a neutrophil or a red blood cell close by, you notice the sizes increase. Another a characteristic a clue, very irregular nuclear membranes. They've been likened to popcorn type nuclei. Notice these grooves uh, uh, that you can see here, right? So so-called tulip cells or those grooves, irregular nuclear membranes and sometimes they look like okay glandular honeycomb but drunken honeycomb there may be some areas where they're very close together and overlapping and other areas where they aren't but again notice you can see the uh, grooves the ink the variation in nuclear size this pleomorphism high nucleus to cytoplasmic ratio so uh, nucleomegaly uh, um, you know, much nuclei are larger than, you know, the red blood cells, there's anisonucleosis, there's four to one or greater variation in size of the nuclei. You can see these very irregular nuclear membranes or those grooves, so-called tulip nuclei, 
and abnormal thick nuclear membranes may be nucleoli, mitosis, maybe even uh, a necrotic background as well. And then you can do um, stains for pancreatic ductal calcium, particularly when it's metastatic, when you see it in, in different body sites. Another pancreatic tumor that's very classic appearance. This is solid and papery epithelial neoplasm, you know, usually young female and uh, very cellular. And notice these nuclei, uh, oftentimes they may be bare strip nuclei. And this is a very classic appearance that you see over here. Again, uh, lots of bare nuclei sort of resembles lymphocytes or neuroendocrine tumor. But then notice these little highlined uh, globules that you can see here as well. So um, young women, and it's an indolent low-grade malignancy. So if it's taken out with clear margins, the patient does well. Well, and you know it has this uh, sort of radiologic appearance of a cystic and solid, maybe multi-loculated, and this is a classic appearance on the cell block where you see these uh, cells and this central area appearing uh, like that. So uh, microacina structures, uh, sort of bare capillaries in the background, these stromal cores, monomorphic tumor cells, very bland nuclei. Sometimes they can even have grooves. And then these um, highline uh, globules. And, uh, and your differential would be a neuroendocrine uh, tumor, but it's negative for the neuroendocrine markers. Well, CD56 is not really a neuroendocrine marker, you know, specific. But um, then you can do um, the um, stains uh, for uh, solid and papery epithelial neoplasm, and your differential would be other bland lesions such as endocrine uh, tumors and, and uh, sort of even asana tumors can have bare nuclei, but uh, oftentimes they may be, uh, you know, clinically a different presentation. Okay, some miscellaneous lesions that I'd like to uh, talk about. Melanoma, you should recognize melanoma. It can look like anything. Uh, it can be melanotic, amelanotic. It can be spindle-shaped, epithelioid, plasmacytoid, maybe binucleate, prominent nucleoli, macronucleoli. And um, this is one of the tumors that can have intranuclear clearing, right? Here's an example with, you know, melanin being produced, this powdery melanin, uh, not just in the cell, maybe even in the background. Uh, so uh, melanoma and also very dehesive. The only time the melanoma cells are close together would be uh, in a perithelomatous um, um, location. So just around blood vessels, right? Otherwise, so uh, uh, recognize melanoma. It can really, it should be near differential for just about all lesions. Meningioma, uh, the classic example of meningioma, you can see the whirling, right? Meningioma is also one of the tumors known as the whirling over here. You can also have those empty appearing nuclei. So melanoma, meningioma, papery, uh, you know, papery tumors, particularly papery thyroid uh, carcinoma, glycogenated nuclei in HC, HCC or just in liver, Wilson's disease. These are some of the ones that can have these empty uh, nuclei. Um, and then, you know, viral inclusions, you know, here is herpes virus where you have a true inclusion with the chromatin being sort of pushed uh, to the edge and then um, multinucleation molding of the nuclei uh, and there's these mulberry shaped uh, clusters so herpes uh, virus infection you know in a pregnant woman they may ask you uh, and then you know of course it's one of the indications for the child being delivered by cesarean section prostatic uh, carcinoma um, Whenever you see microacinar complexes, particularly in a metastatic site, the two things you need to think about, prostate and thyroid, these should be the number, the first two that you think of. Older male prominent nucleoli, think about prostate carcinoma and do the um, stains. A classic uh, 
appearance for seminoma, uh, this tigroid background. So these are the tumor germ cells, no the stains for seminoma. And uh, with seminoma, you may see lymphocytes, lots of lymphocytes and plasma cells in the background. But the cytoplasm of these um, tumor cells is very delicate. And uh, during smearing, it sort of uh, gives you the streaking appearance and lots of glycogen. And then, so this is the tigroid background for seminoma. And young, uh, young adults think about just germinoma, seminoma, you know, retroperineal lymph nodes, uh, also in the mediastinum, uh, you know, maybe a primary uh, sort of tumor, mediastinal tumor arising from a teratoma um, or germ cell tumor or in the um, anterior mediastinum, even in the pineal region, so just a seminoma. Merkel cell carcinoma, neuroendocrine tumor, salt and pepper chromatin, notice the streaking in the background associated uh, with um, uh, BK virus infection, CK20 positive, positive for the neuroendocrine markers. Just um, whenever you see aspirates that have this papillary morphology, in the head and neck, of course, papillary thyroid carcinoma would be the first thing, uh, and uh, you know, vascular cause papillary architecture in the breast. The papillary lesions may be a papilloma, could be papillary carcinoma, uh, and then other um, papillary tumors in different body sites, such as ovary, kidney, um, etc. Um, the perithelomatous growth uh, that you see in sarcomas and melanoma, where they're only uh, close to where the blood vessels are, may resemble, <coughs> excuse me, papillary architecture. This is showing papillary thyroid carcinoma. Uh, this is a papilla here. Notice the intranuclear pseudo inclusion here and here. Uh, maybe a hint of a groove here. So very, and uh, this is a low power view showing the uh, characteristic papillary architecture. And here's a hint of a blood vessel going through. Uh, spindle cell lesions or sarcomas, um, spindle cell nuclei. And again, perithelomatous growth, they'll only uh, cluster around blood vessels, right? But otherwise they're very dehesive, as you can see over here and you would need to do pertinent stains for that. So uh, basically, uh, they're coming up with lots of uh, reporting terminologies. I talked about the Bethesda system, the Milan system, uh, and in urinary cytology, they have the Paris system, and they have the Yokohama system for breast cytology, the Sydney classification system for reporting lymph node cytology, International system for reporting serous fluid cytopathology, and there's a WHO a soft tissue cytopathology system. But uh, the general rule is, you know, non-diagnostic, you know, negative, something benign, atypical. Then you say, you know, favor benign, or you know, uh, you just can't tell, or suspicious um, for malignancy, positive for malignant cells, or you know maybe other. In, uh, you know, other lesions. So um, that uh, brings me uh, to the end. And uh, basically, uh, it's a quick review of what I thought were uh, some uh, classic examples from different body sites. And let me see if there are any questions. I'll open it up for that. Thank you so much, Dr. Raza, for this uh, excellent overview of, uh, uh, broad overview, I would say, of uh, so many different entities in cytology on an image-based manner. And I'm sure that would be very helpful for the trainees. Thank I saw a few questions. So I can read them for you. Okay. So one question is, uh, how do you differentiate ASCUS from uh, you know, low-grade uh, squamous intraepithelial lesion? Okay, um, that's a, a very uh, good question. Uh, so, uh, ask us versus uh, low grade uh, squamous uh, intraepithelial lesion. Well, uh, with the newer Bethesda system for GYN, uh, 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 
cytology reporting, they divided ASCUS into ASCUS NOS and ASCUS high grade, because otherwise we were just seeing atypical squamous um, cells of undetermined significance, right? So when you just say ASCUS, you basically don't know if it's a typical squamous uh, lesion and it could just be reactive reparative or it could be low grade. So the clinician does not have to worry about high grade lesions. Now, how do you differentiate ASCUS from reactive and, and from low grade? Uh, for a normal um, uh, sort of a cell size, let me see, I can use, well, in GYN cytology, we use the intermediate cell nucleus as a yardstick, right? So in ASCUS, uh, the, it's, uh, the nucleus is increased in size, and it may be two, even up to two and a half times the size of a normal intermediate um, cell nucleus. But if it's three times the size or more than it's obviously low grade. And again, for both ASCUS and a low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion, the features that you're concerned about will be in superficial and intermediate cells. So it's a larger cell size. If, if you're worried about atypia and the cell size is parabasal or more basaloid, then it's going to be ASCUS age or obviously um, high grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. All right. Thank you, Dr. Raza. Uh, there is another question. Say so again, uh, so how do you differentiate between a Hartle cell neoplasm versus Hashimoto's thyroiditis on a thyroid FNA? Okay, so the question is Hartle cell lesion or neoplasm versus Hashimoto. It would be helpful if you had the, uh, uh, you know, the history. Uh, we spent so much time going into the chart and, you know, figuring out does the patient have uh, had does the patient have lymphocytic or Hashimoto thyroiditis? Have they done the serology? What you know? What are they suspecting? And uh, you know. First, you have to identify these oncocytic Hertel cells, right? Uh, cells with uh, abundant cytoplasm that's granular because it contains lots of mitochondria. And in Hertel cell neoplasia, the cells tend to be more monomorphic. The ugliest Hertel cells you'll see would be in Hashimoto's. And also in Hashimoto's, uh, look at the background. You, you should be able to pick up lots of lymphocytes, maybe plasma cells, not just in the background, but also in the cytoplasm of these um, oncocytic cells. Right. Um, thank you, Dr. Raza, again. So here is uh, another question on thyroid cytology. The intranuclear inclusion in papillary thyroid carcinoma is traditionally taught as processing artifacts. So how does it come in cytology? That's the question. Uh, okay. Yes, we've been taught uh, in histology, it's because of formalin fixation. You have those empty orphanani nuclei. Um, and that's uh, that's because of uh, papri thyroid carcinoma being hypochromatic, right? So that's why it appears to be clear. Uh, however, even if you look in, histo in histology, not just cytology, but even on the sections, um, the uh, uh, tumors uh, that are papillary and have a moderate amount of cytoplasm, for some reason, the cytoplasm invaginates and it comes to lie between the nucleus and the nuclear membrane. And the reason we know that it's a pseudo inclusion is by EM studies, because in these pseudo inclusions, you can see the same organelles that should be present in the cytoplasm. So um, the um, artifact of fixation is for often any nuclei in histology, and that's because of formalin fixation and because these tumors are hypochromatic and the nuclei appear to be empty, as in the um, cartoon character often any, very classic. Now, but even in histology as well as cytology, the intranuclear cytoplasmic inclusions, uh, they won't completely occupy the nucleus. It'll be about uh, more than half or two thirds of the nucleus. And the inside of that pseudo inclusion resembles the cytoplasm of that tumor cell. Right, thank you. Uh, the next is more of a comment, it seems, uh, again, related to thyroid cytology. 
So in cases in thyroid with no cells in smear and few groups of cells in cell block with no clear nuclear details, we report it as benign or unsatisfactory. Um, that's something, it depends on the clinical, because I always put down, you know, recommend a correlation with clinical and imaging. And we often um, doing the aspirates or providing rows at the time of these fine needle aspiration. If we uh, get the specimens and we do a diff quake stain, if we see lots of free watery colloid and histiocytes and, you know, barely any thyroid follicular cells, we'll call them and say, hey, you know, um, uh, it kind of looks like a degenerating colloid uh, or follicular nodule. What's your impression? Oftentimes, uh, something that's a clue is that the patient has a multi-nodular goiter. It's not the only nodule, but they may be going after the larger nodule. And But then if you just see histiocytes, maybe not too much uh, of the free watery colloid, then it's going to be unsatisfactory because um, papillary thyroid carcinoma can be cystic. You're not sure what's causing the cystic lesion. You may have a, you know, just a um, sort of, um, you know, a cyst because of uh, other um, lesions as well. But, you know, but papillary thyroid carcinoma needs to be uh, ruled out in these uh, patients. And yes, some people say, well, yes, you know, the hamburger criteria, you want to see groups of cells, six to 10 cells and, you know, six groups each, but it really depends on the clinical findings. Sometimes you can, it can be very uh, scant cellularity, but if you see classic uh, nuclear abnormalities, then you can pretty much go suspicious for, or if you see papillary architecture or some other bodies, you can say, well, hey, this is papillary thyroid carcinoma. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the number of cells and all, Dr. Raja. So can you highlight for the trainees the situations in thyroid cytology when the adequacy criteria is not required for diagnosis. Um, just like in GYN cytology and uh, other body sites, you know, we always want, hey, we need so many cells, et cetera. If you see something that's obviously malignant, um, you know, maybe not just one cell, but more than one cell. If it's enough uh, for you to trigger it being malignant, it may be atypical mitosis. For example, you know, definitely dysplastic. You can't call it um, sort of inadequate. For example, uh, look at this nucleus here, how irregular the chromatin is, the nuclear membrane uh, um, irregularity, and also variable thickness of the nuclear membrane. These are all things associated with dysplasia and malignancy, very high NC ratio. These would be uh, uh, cases where you would be able to call it. And sometimes it's, uh, you know, the amount of cellularity that you needed is less. Uh, for example, if the patient has a known history of papillary thyroid carcinoma was treated with surgery, and then a year or so later, the patient's coming back and they're going after neck lymph nodes, and you see, uh, you know, one or two cells with obvious papillary thyroid carcinoma features, it's enough to call it then. Right. Or the thyroid bed as well. Right. Thank you. Maybe like if there is inflammatory pathology, and then it is obvious, and then there are no associated thyroid follicular cells, still it is adequate for a diagnosis, isn't it? Um, it you know what? Um, it, again, they have to call it because they may say they've uh, gone after uh, the thyroid gland. Maybe they went, uh, what they aspirated instead was a perithyroidal lymph node, a neck lymph node, parathyroid tissue. But there is de Quervin's thyroiditis in which you see inflammatory cells. You'll see lots mm -hmm. of giant cells inflammatory cells and, you know, barely any uh, thyroid follicular cells, but just the clinical history of tenderness of the thyroid, maybe a recent upper respiratory infection, sort of viral infection would be enough to call it in right. those cases. Thank you. The next question is about um, uh, how do you report HIV lymphadenopathy on cytology? Oh, that is difficult. <laughs> um, when I um, see that, well, the thing for HIV uh, lymphadenopathy would be um, in patients, 
if there's the lymph node is enlarged, it's been there for uh, a certain period of time, it's more than two cm, and um, we'll we'll do the aspirate. And if we see, you know, monomorphism, we would um, it would trigger us uh, at the time of rose to say, hey, send it for flow cytometry. And of course, I would consult with my colleagues, get a great cell block, get flow, and then do that. Uh, but then the other HIV uh, lesions that I've seen, and I'm not an expert in hematopathology. Uh, maybe sort of, uh, uh, you know, there are different reporting categories for that. But uh, my hematopathology colleagues, even in some lesions where we want to, uh, we, we're quite uh, confident that it's definitely um, lymphoma or Hodgkin's lymphoma, except, you know, uh, uh, things like that. They'll say, yes, but, uh, you know, they want tissue. They want more, more um, so that they can send for molecular and run additional tests as well. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Uh, here's the next question. I think this is classic, uh, as we always struggle. How do you differentiate reactive mesothelial cells from mesothelioma? <laughs> it's very difficult. One clue for mesothelioma would be you see lots and lots more mesothelial cells. They're larger in size and the groups are larger, right? So larger mesothelial cells in larger groups you know, an abundance of them, but sometimes you can miss them as well, right? And if there's any doubt, you, of course, you think about the clinical, has the patient had, you know, been in an occupation where they were exposed to maybe asbestos? And clinically, are they saying that there is a thickening of the pleura? Sometimes they won't even know that until after we've called it mesothelioma. But uh, if you, uh, if there's any doubt, if it is, uh, you know, just benign reactive mesothelial cells, you can get a lot of that, if, particularly if the patient has, you know, uh, a chest tube in um, or, you know, recent surgery or uh, infection. Then, um, you know, uh, lately, uh, the, uh, the ones that we're using a lot, uh, we set it off um, for BAP1 loss and MTAP loss. So these are very helpful. Uh, one, you want to uh, make sure the mesothelial cells are not adenocarcinoma or other type of tumor cells. So you do calretinin, WT1, D240, so mesothelial markers, and then you do adenomarkers to exclude adenocarcinoma. And the ones you know that these are mesothelial cells, then the next step would be to do the um, uh, BAP1 and MTAP uh, loss uh, studies. Um, I've been fooled, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, older woman, uh, peritoneal fluid, and I said, oh, tumor cells. And I said, oh, it's, it, they look very much like um, ovarian carcinoma, high grades, a serous carcinoma, but there was uh, something they weren't quite staining properly. Uh, and then at tumor board, the radiologist said, you know, hey, could this be mesothelioma? And yes, it was. So you can even have, you know, uh, primary uh, peritoneal uh, mesothelioma as well. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, here's another question for you. Any suggestion for processing CSF if the volume is low? Do you suggest any salvage method to process the sample for cytospin techniques? Thank you. Uh, we have problems with our CSF. Uh, what happens when they uh, take the CSF off? Uh, they, uh, they split the specimen, they send some to the clinical lab and we get the rest. The main thing I want for them, from them is we need a fresh specimen. Please, uh, you know, um, give us a fresh uh, specimen and then uh, we um, do, do a cytology prep and then if there's enough cellularity we try and get a cell block if we really can't um, and if there's insufficient then we'll ask you know if it's uh, clinically safe could you send us some more we worried about that and maybe not split the sample but if, if we, but many times you have patients with known lymphoma leukemia and they're giving intrathecal 
physical therapy and that's when they'll be tapping them and you may see um, um, these abnormal cells and then the other thing we need to know is could this just be blood contamination you know uh, rather than pure csf involvement but um, we ask for a fresh sample and more fluid uh, to come to us uh, and then if we suspect uh, hematopoietic malignancy, then we would suggest uh, uh, that they correlate with the flow um, cytometry findings. And the small round blue cell tumors, for example, medulloblastoma, we can see obvious uh, abnormal cells with the molding high NC ratios, breast carcinoma cells, uh, you know, can we see a few examples of those and uh, we can you know do a stain on that uh, and sometimes just by morphology the prominent nucleoli you may be able to just say hey this this patient has known metastatic breast carcinoma and it's here in the csf as well uh dr Radha. so this one is about breast cytology you mentioned about the uh, yokohama system for reporting breast cytology so in your practice, how much do you actually get breast cytology? Is it totally replaced by biopsies? Uh, do you want to comment on that? Um, um, yes, uh, breast uh, cytopathology was such a hot topic in, you know, 80s and 90s, and it just went away here in the West because uh, stereotactic and core biopsies uh, because one thing they said, well, you know, uh, how do we know if it's uh, high grade DCIS versus invasive carcinoma? And then, uh, you know, with core biopsies, you get much more uh, tissue. They can, uh, you can do ER, PR, and HER2 on good cell blocks for breast carcinoma as well, but it just went away. And, you know, but uh, in, uh, in uh, where we do still get breast, um, uh, breast um, fine needle aspirations would be in those young patients where they're obvious it's benign, that it's fibrous, they say, hey, lumpy, bumpy breast, cyclical pain, they suspect fibrocystic change, they aspirate the lesion, it goes away, there's no mass, and you know the fluid may be clear, it comes to us and we can see foam cells, maybe some apricot cells, so fibrocystic change, or if they really quite convinced uh, clinically it's a fibroadenoma and they just want to do an FNA to reassure the patient if they just want to follow it up for a while or in cases where they're convinced it's malignant right that's when they will do these aspirates to say you know can you just confirm it's malignant maybe the patient is a poor candidate to go immediately to surgery or it's the easiest way to do that and um, also in infection acute mastitis um, infections, uh, we would, uh, we see it in uh, um, fibrocystic change, infections, obvious benign such as fibroadenoma or obvious malignant, maybe the patient has um, sort of um, inflammatory carcinoma, sort of a clinical presentation. Or also patients who've had mastectomy or, uh, or partial um, uh, lumpec you know, sort of lumpectomy and there's a mass uh, uh, in the same breast, uh, then we would get FNAs. Sometimes we get FNAs of the axillary uh, nodes. Uh, we, you know, we can even get cores of lymph nodes now as well. So these are some of the ones that we get them. Um, the, I, I did not show you um, an example because, uh, now there's much more acceptance, you know, granulomatous um, mastitis and the um, cystic neutrophilic granulomatous mastitis, you know, very alarming a woman who's maybe um, lactating or recently delivered a child and there's this breast mass that keeps growing and they're worried, are we missing uh, cancer there or, you know, what is it? So uh, if you see a neutrophils, uh, you know, uh, 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 giant cells, you know, sort of mixture of that and the clinical history, the patient's lactating, then you would suggest cystic neutrophilic granulomatous mastitis. And even for the cultures, you tell them we're suspecting uh, this entity and, you know, they need to um, culture for much uh, longer to identify the causative uh, organism. 
No, thank you, I, uh, Dr. Raja. This is helpful. I think uh, these are the questions uh, I saw online. Oh, here is one last question, Dr. Raja. So maybe you mentioned about it already that uh, the question is about uh, oncocytoma in salivary gland versus a Wartin tumor. So can you elaborate on that? Yes. Um, Oncocytoma versus Warden tumor. Yes, Warden tumor has these oncocytes. However, in Warden, uh, all salivary gland lesions can be cystic, right? So, uh, but Warden tumors, you know, classic smoking history, cystic, dark fluid. But um, in um, Warden tumor, not only would you see oncocytes, you should see lots of lymphocytes in this sort of grungy right. background. Uh, what I find so helpful is the cell block where you see that by, you know, bilayered oncocytic epithelium uh, with that lymphoid uh, aggregate just beneath it. That is so classic. So the cell block is so helpful. And now for oncocytoma versus oncocytic carcinoma, you should just see oncocytic cells, sheets of that. Usually it's benign oncocytoma, but uh, you know, there are rare cases of oncocytic carcinoma. There's absence of lymphocytes in, in those cases. And the other thing is, um, because of the cytoplasm, it's abundant. Your other differential would be acidic cell carcinoma, but acidic cell carcinoma traversing capillaries and there'll be zymogen granules. And then um, you, you may do stains um, um, for, you know, PAS diastase and other um, dog one stains for the acidic cell tumors. Uh, no, thank you again, Dr. Raza. I think these are all the questions that I found that was the last question. And we really want to thank you for this uh, excellent overview and a really broad overview covering so many uh, aspects of cytology, which itself is such a you know, broad specialty and one would need several lectures and one lecture on each topic itself. And uh, we really appreciate you for doing this in, a, in such a short time. And I hope the trainees would find it very useful. And you would be happy to know, Dr. Raza, that uh, we had uh, over 100 viewers who joined from different countries. And uh, I could keep track of some of the viewers who mentioned where they are from. So they joined as far away from uh, Serbia, Somalia, Slovakia, Guyana, uh, Republic of Moldova, Algeria, Cambodia, Egypt, Mexico, India, to name a few, and some joined from US as well. And thanks to our viewers for supporting and uh, you know encouraging our talks. And if you like our lectures, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also follow the Facebook page. And we have a next lecture on June 6th. That would be a dermatopathology talk. And uh, our speaker will be Dr. Katriona McKenzie from Sydney. So she would be speaking on Basal cell carcinoma and WHO fifth edition classification and how to report them and practical tips as well. And the time will be uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time, that is 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. Uh, hope to see you at that time. And thank you again, Dr. Raza. We appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Rifat Manan. And thank you, everybody all over the world from all different time zones. Um, and good luck. And as I say, love cytology. Thank you so much. Thank you.